Thank you for joining us in another lesson from our study in the book of Isaiah. I'll ask if you will to please be turning to chapter 32 as we're going to wind that chapter up today, Lord willing, and then move into chapter 33, which is the last of the woes in this book of woes that is comprised by chapters 28 through 33 of Isaiah. It's been a little bit since we've had our class. Uh, We were out of town last week. Uh, And so let's back up, let's uh, review, and then we'll have our flow for moving here through chapter 32. In chapter 31, we see woe to worldly ties. We're looking at a faithless trust in verses 1 through 3. Their tie at this time seemed to be Egypt. And Isaiah was letting them know that that should not be, cannot be the case. Rather, he said in verses 4 and 5 of that chapter, they should trust in God. And verses 6 through 9 indicated that what they were doing was wrong and sin because they were told to repent in those verses. Then as we move into the chapter that we're winding up today, chapter 32, we see a glorious future that's predicted. You see the king and the new day that is addressed there in verses one through eight. And you might remember that we were talking about some disagreement that is seen, different ideas, different opinions that are stated here. Some believe that it's Hezekiah. Others believe it's messianic. This could very well be messianic in nature. In verses nine through 14, the complacent women were told both of judgment and hope. And we looked at several other places where they were addressed. Chapter 3 from 1, the book of Amos, refers to the kine, cows of Bashan. Kine, New King, uh, King James, cows, New King James. And now we're looking at justice as a future promise. And this is going to be seen in verses 15 through 20 of our text. So let's read that. And then let's finish up this discussion before we move into chapter 33. Until the Spirit is poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field, and the fruitful field is counted as a forest, then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. The work of righteousness will be peace. And the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. My people will dwell in a peaceful habitation, in secure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. Though hail comes down on the forest, and the city is brought low in humiliation. Blessed are you who sow beside all waters, who send out freely the feed of the ox and the donkey. There in verse 15, we we look at this phrase regarding the the Spirit being poured out from on high. And again, this is a difficult passage. Part of the problem in dealing with Isaiah is trying to determine the historical context, whether it's talking about something in his day, or whether it's talking about something messianic, or whether we see something in his day that can be continued in thought, in a messianic fulfillment. So, who is he referring to here? regarding this spirit being poured out from on high. Was he signifying the ruling principle governing the seed of Jacob? Was he talking about the new life being lived by the people of God that comes by his spirit? We see Shackelford, we see Leopold, all commentators, likewise uh, Homer Haley having some differing views there. Homer Haley and Clyde Clyde Woods see that language referring to the Holy Spirit being poured out on Pentecost. If we see at least part of the last section being fulfilled messianically a part of this chapter, that could very well be. It's difficult to be dogmatic, however, about exactly what he's talking about. The principle is clear. God's going to pour out his spirit. The context, the how he does so is not always as clear. So therefore, maybe we need to step back and see a bigger picture to this. 
Maybe we need to see the reference to the time here. And we could see a future fulfillment. We do know that the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out on Pentecost. And we've already seen uh, Isaiah chapter 2 being fulfilled at that time as well, referring to that first gospel sermon that's going to be preached. The word of the Lord is going to come out of Jerusalem. Uh, The mountain of the Lord's house is going to be established. All nations are going to be drawn to it. We see clearly... uh, Acts chapter 2 and Peter's sermon on Pentecost Day as a fulfillment of that messianic prophecy. And so we could at least see a continuation of that as we look at this passage. The truth being emphasized, big picture, is that God is the source of blessing for those who follow him. Is it referring to something now in their future? Yes, if they were turn away from Egypt, if they would repent, if they would put their trust in God rather than human alliances, then God would indeed bless them. He's the source of those things. When we do look ahead to Pentecost and we see the Spirit being poured out, we see a God again as the source of the blessings that are going to come on the people. So, Likely, it's better for us to see a big picture here where we can see two different things in particular that might fulfill that big picture. Then we move into verses 16 and 18, and we see justice, righteousness, peace, quiet, and confidence are going to be the result of divine intervention. Now, this is important again to keep in the context. They thought security. They thought quietness, they thought peace, they thought all of those things would come through an alliance with Egypt, a man-made alliance. And Isaiah has told them numerous times and in numerous ways that that simply was not going to happen. Here, he's reiterating the truth that these things are only going to be found in God. Clyde Wood says this in his commentary, society transformed by God in the Messianic age, would thus be the exact opposite of that which Judah experienced in Isaiah's day. That quote is found in Brother Shackelford's commentary on the book of Isaiah. So we see again big picture, but we also see a lesson for us today in that the Justice, righteousness, peace, quietness, confidence, security, none of these things are available through associations with man. None of these things are available through a system devised by man or through principles that are established by man. It's only going to be through God and his will and his time that these things are going to be seen. And we may even have to reshape what our understanding of those things are. When you look at justice, what did Judah deserve here? Judah deserved punishment because of their rejection of God and their failure to put their trust in God. When we look and see what's going on today, our summer series here at the Granbury Street Church of Christ is on the phrase, I I don't think that word means what you think it means. Well, let's borrow from that and go to a little bit different area. I don't think happiness and contentment and enjoyment and security, it's not found where men think that it's found today. You can find almost anything you want to to find in the religious world today. You can find almost any form of worship. You can find almost any concept of relationship with one another. You can clearly find more than one way for man to quote-unquote be saved, you can see many different ways in which God is worshipped. But we need to understand there is only one way that is acceptable to God. There's only one body. There's only one system of faith. There's only one Savior. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, those seven ones upon which unity is based. Judah needed to learn that lesson. And sadly, man continues to need to learn that lesson today about God being the source, the only source, but it's in his time and it's by his will that those things are going to be found. 
Verse 19 is another difficult verse. Though hail comes down on the forest and the city is brought low in humiliation. But again, it seems to indicate the presence of enemies in the Messianic age. Chapter 32 seems to largely be pointing to that, or at least a fulfillment, and maybe a primary fulfillment of what is being addressed, is what we see being referred to there. The enemies there are being referred to as a forest and a city. And so therefore, this seems to refer to judgment. If Judah does not repent, they're going to be judged. And sadly, that's going to be the case. It's going to be later. Another prophet, Jeremiah, is going to be sent to them, and he reiterated much of what Isaiah had prophesied, but Jeremiah was much closer to the day. As a matter of fact, it's quite likely that Jeremiah saw Babylonian captivity and saw his threats come to be as it related to Judah's refusal to repent and God using Babylon to bring about justice, their punishment of what is being seen. Hail is that which also symbolized judgment, and that's seen in various passages. We've we've already seen it in chapter 28, verses 2 and 17. We've already seen it in chapter 30 and verse 3. Exodus 9 uses the same symbolism as does the book of Haggai. Haggai chapter 2, verses 14 and 17. So clearly, some sense of judgment is what's being spoken of in that passage. Quite likely, it's referring to Isaiah's day, and it could also very well be referring to the Messianic age, the age in which we live. Therefore, the principle continuing to even be true. God, at some point in time, only he knows when it's going to happen is going to open the time up for Christ to come back, his second coming. It's going to be that which signals the end of time as we know it. And then people are going to be going off into their eternity, whether it's eternity in torment or whether it's an eternity in heaven. That judgment is going to occur. And how man sees his relationship with God is going to be key in that sense of judgment. In verse 20, domestic animals would have ample grazing because of the earth's bounty. Again, we go back to chapter 30, verses 23 to 25 to see symbolism. That future promise is what we see there in chapter 32. It's a glorious future that's predicted if people will only lay hold of what God provides for them. Now let's move into chapter 33 as we begin to wind down this book of woes. We're going to look at chapter 33. We won't have the time to finish it today. And then we'll complete it next time. And then we'll be moving into our next session, section, which is verses 34 and 35, uh, that is going to be addressed And in those chapters, we're looking again at God's judgment on the nations that is going to be coming. Woe to the destroyer is what is addressed now in chapter 33. The historical background, again, is something we always want to determine. What's going on at the time that Isaiah wrote this or spoke this message? It seems to be about 701 B.C., and that's going to put us in the time of Sennacherib's invasion into Judah. Remember that in 722 B.C., Assyria had already carried away the ten northern tribes of Israel, and he continued to try to come down, and he was going to take Judah, and Sennacherib was going to do that, and this is therefore going to be sometime about the time of Hezekiah because Hezekiah and Sennacherib basically came head to head. And we see God's miraculous delivery of Hezekiah in the destruction of 185,000 of Sennacherib's army. Even though Judah had been paying tribute to Assyria, Assyria continued to seek to destroy cities within the 
area of what we know as the two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, or of the kingdom of Judah. Remember, the kingdom of Israel is no more. They lost that. Sadly, Judah is going to lose that national distinction. Right now, they still had it. They were an an area, a kingdom, though, that Assyria wanted. Even though tribute was being paid, they were kind of eating away at the edges. And eventually, Jerusalem was going to be their source. Sennacherib fully intended to destroy Jerusalem. And as I said, it was only through God's miraculous divine um uh, intervention that that was averted clearly hezekiah did what his predecessors did not do he trusted in god to be delivered so the destroyer to be destroyed let's look at verses 1 through 6 of our text woe to you who plunder though you have not been plundered And you who deal treacherously, though they have not dealt treacherously with you. When you cease plundering, you will be plundered. When you make an end of dealing treacherously, they will deal treacherously with you. O Lord, be gracious to us. We have waited for you. Be their arm every morning, our salvation also in the time of trouble. At the noise of the tumult, the people shall flee. When you lift yourself up, the nations shall be scattered. And your plunder shall be gathered like the gathering of the caterpillar. As the running to and fro of locusts, he shall run upon them. The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He has filled Zion with justice and righteousness. Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times and the strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Note that the king of Assyria is the one who's being addressed here in verse 1 of the text. As we've indicated in just these few introductory comments just previously made, even after receiving tribute, he continued on his quest to destroy Jerusalem. 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 14 through 16, gives us a historical sketch of that as well. Why would anyone want to trust Assyria? Sennacherib, king of Assyria at this time, was bloodthirsty. He was horrible. He treated people horribly. He was treacherous in his dealing with others. Who would want to put their trust in him? Why would someone want to trust him? Why would this even be addressed? Well, remember that Judah had already shown a propensity to try to find some kind of salvation in human relations. But they were told not to trust Assyria. They were not to trust Egypt because Egypt was going to fall. Now they're not going to to put their trust in Assyria because they're promised here that Assyria is going to fall. All along, God wanted them to put their trust in him. And Hezekiah was one of those good kings who did that. Hezekiah would have trouble later. We'll see some of that that's being addressed. But at this point, we see him being a good king. We see him being one of those reformed kings as Josiah was, literally gathering up the things of idolatry and throwing them in the Kidron Valley to be destroyed. But now in verse 2, Isaiah, the prophet, is shown as praying on behalf of the people and praying on behalf of the city of Jerusalem. Again, the phrase, waiting for God, we have waited for you, is the idea of putting their trust in him. Isaiah asked that God be their arm every morning. Other translation uses the word strength there, the arm and the muscles of the arm. That's what's being typified. As strength, but they're asking for God to be their strength, not in a physical arm, not in a physical body, not in physical power, but allow God to do these things through His power. He's wanted to do so all along. It was a stubborn and obstinate people that were refusing to allow that to happen. 
We've already indicated that Isaiah often referred to God's arm as an image of divine strength. In verses 3 and 4, caterpillars and locusts were pests that destroyed the crops, destroyed trees. However, Isaiah here portrays his trust, as Hezekiah also did, that God would be able to deliver them. There's no doubt in Isaiah's mind that if Judah allowed it to happen, if Judah would simply put their trust in God, if Hezekiah, the leader of Judah, would put his trust in God, there was no doubt that God would prevent whatever Sennacherib through their way, whatever they tried to accomplish. The law of sowing and reaping is that which is clearly what is shown in Scripture. We see that in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Whatsoever a man sows, that he will also reap. If we sow worldliness, we're going to reap world, worldliness. But if we sow spiritual things, if we sow that which is God's will, then we're going to reap a spiritual harvest. Here, Assyria has been portrayed as plunderers. They had been portrayed as being treacherous. And they're going to get what they have coming to them. They've sowed those things. Likewise, they're going to reap those things. If we're looking at 701 BC being the primary historical context, it's going to be God miraculously who is going to bring this about. But we can also move ahead just a little bit into about the year 612 BC, not quite a hundred years down the road. We're going to see the ultimate fulfillment of this when God uses Babylon to bring down Assyria. Nabopolazar begins it. Nebuchadnezzar, his son, continues it. And sadly, that's also going to be when God brings his judgment on Judah because of their failure to maintain the penitent spirit that some of their leaders have. Hezekiah is a good ruler. Josiah was a good ruler. But as we get down closer to the time of Babylonian captivity, we see one bad king after another who is going to bring these things about. Verse 5 talks about God being exalted. In Hebrew, again, in the Hebrew text, the word exalted is the first word of this sentence, emphasizing the importance of that word. If we're looking at our text, boldface it, highlight it, underline it, put an exclamation point after it, exalted. God is going to be exalted. That's the primary point of this text. God, as he steps out and acts on behalf of his people, has shown himself to be just and righteous. As God's people seek him, they're going to be blessed. He's going to care for them. That's justice. You see, God has promised that. It is conditional. God is only tied to doing what he promises of a conditional nature when God's peoples meet those conditions. God wanted to care for his people. He wanted to protect his people. He promised to do so all the way back to the time of Joshua but it was conditional in nature. If they continued to follow him, if they continued to put their trust in him, those things would indeed be the case. So now as Hezekiah puts his trust in God, God now steps forward because he's just and righteous and does exactly what he said he would do. God expected them to respond by restoring these spiritual qualities in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the capital, if you will, of Judah. There were a lot of things going on that were wrong religiously. The political as well as the spiritual leaders were not doing what they were supposed to be doing. People were being abused. They were seeking man-made solutions. God wanted a restoration to occur, repentance leading to a restoration where those spiritual qualities 
would be seen there in Jerusalem. Oftentimes, people refuse religion because they see God as ready to strike a judgment blow on people. It's almost like God, in their mind, is just waiting for men to slip up where God can slap them down in judgment. That's not the God that I see portrayed in Scripture. I do see God blasting his people, judging his people, often harshly when they fail to do his will, but that's not what he wants to do. His justice and his righteousness demand it, but God would rather bless his people. He would rather they follow them, him, heed his will, do things his way, push the idols, push these human institutions out of the way, follow God and his will and be blessed. It's the same today. God does not want men to slip up. Matthew 23, 37. I haven't quoted it in a few sessions. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her. How often I wanted to gather you together as a hen gathered her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. If we are lost eternally, it's going to be for one reason and one reason only, because we did not choose salvation because we did not choose to put our trust in God. Rather, we chose to go our way. We chose to go by our will, our whims, our fancies. Along the same lines, those whose life is going to be judged, where they spend an eternity in torment, is going to be because they chose that path. God is not willing that any should perish, according to Peter, but that all should come. To repentance. Last verse of this section, and this is where we'll stop today. The word translated as stability there. Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times. That's from the same Hebrew root as faith, and it means constancy or trustworthiness. We need to have stability, but it's the same concept of faith. It's stability that's based on what God has revealed to us and our submitting our wills to it. To fear God is to manifest the proper awe and respect for God. This is the principle upon which a dedicated life is lived. We're going to stop there today. Thank you again for your interest in this study. Pray that we'll continue to look to God and his will, that that's what our stability will be based upon, that we will sow those spiritual things that spiritual fruit may be born. Until next time, God bless you.